Welcome, everyone, uh, to this inaugural presentation of uh, Beyond the End of the World, the Mellon Sawyer Seminar at UC Santa Cruz, which comprises a year-long research and exhibition project, including a public lecture series bringing leading thinkers, uh, visionary writers, and cultural practitioners to campus, and this evening, Kianga Yamada-Taylor, to discuss what lies beyond dystopian catastrophism and how we can cultivate radical futures of social justice and ecological flourishing. Next up, we have Amitav Ghosh on February 27th with Nick Estes and Melanie Yazi of the Red Nation and Amin Hussein and Natasha Dillon of Decolonize This Place in the spring term. So hopefully you'll all be able to join us for those uh, upcoming uh, presentations as well. I'm TJ Demos of the Department of History of Art and Visual Culture and the Center of Creative Ecologies and the director of the Mellon Project. And before introducing Professor Taylor, I'd like to first thank my UCSC colleagues, Professors Hunter Bivens, Mayanthi Fernando, Debbie Gould, and Matt O'Hara of our Mellon's UCSC organizing group and the, the Humanities Institutes, Irena Pulich and Evan Guy, who are helping administer the project, and the Arts Division for their support, our Mellon Dissertation Fellows, Chessa Adsit Morris and Isabel Carbonell, and everyone else, including at the Mellon Foundation, who have made this free and open event possible. Special appreciation goes to Debbie Gould, professor of sociology here at UCSC, who will join and moderate the Q&A after Kienga's presentation, when there will also be time for audience questions. My biggest thanks for this evening goes to Kienga Yamada-Taylor, who is an award-winning author on race and inequality, as well as black politics and social movements in the US. Her books include From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, How We Get Free, Black Feminism, and the Combahee River Collective, and most recently, Race for Profit, How Banks and the Real Estate Industry Undermine Black Homeownership. Taylor is Distinguished Lecturer for the Organization of American Historians and an Assistant Professor in the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University. I'm really excited that Kianga is our inaugural speaker because she writes so for, uh, forcefully about the politics of liberation, which, drawing on a radical genealogy of intersectionality, foregrounds solidarity in transcending social and identitarian difference, while she also complexly discusses those latter elements in her analyses. Her work addresses urgent, timely and historically entrenched socio-political concerns from housing injustice, structural racism, the contradictions of liberalism, and the pathologies of Trumpism. In doing so, she provides vital resources for our collective ability to survive the dystopian present of ethno-nationalisms, grotesque capitalist inequality, and the divisive class politics of white supremacy. Kienga's studies of the Combahee River Collective and Black Lives Matter and the movement for housing justice model a key ethical political methodology for our Mellon series insofar as she foregrounds visions of emancipatory post-capitalist futurity in traditions of the oppressed, in the on-the-ground struggles of resistance movements those most affected and impacted by the debilitations of global capital, institutional racism, and environmental devastation must, in other words, be centered in the discussions of what comes next, what future worlds we want and can believe in. While we hear from Reverend William Barber of the new Poor People's Campaign that 140 million Americans or over 43% of the population, currently can't pay basic living expenses. We also know that Santa Cruz's own housing and economic precarity is a leading coastal California example of this global trend, owing in part to unregulated real estate speculation, a business-oriented political system, 
and a university pledged to unsustainable growth. The result affects many in our own city, including those in our university, informing the ongoing grad student wildcat strike, a struggle for dignity, a struggle for dignity in working and living conditions, which we hope will soon be resolved in favor of our students. Professor Taylor's work, with one foot in social activism, is close to these struggles. Indeed, she addresses the movement for housing justice in African-American communities in her new book, Race for Profit. And she also defines what solidarity looks like in her book, From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, where she writes, quote, solidarity is standing in unity with people even when you have not personally experienced their particular oppression. The reality is that as long as capitalism exists, material and ideological pressures push all workers to hold each other in general suspicion. But there are moments of struggle when the mutual interests of workers are laid bare, and when the suspicion is finally turned in the other direction, at the plutocrats who live well while the rest of us suffer. She continues, the key question is whether or not in those moments of struggle, a coherent political analysis of society, oppression, and exploitation can be articulated that makes sense of the world in which we live, but that also champions the vision of a different kind of society and a way to get there. It's my hope that we'll hear more about this world and how we might get to that other one this evening. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kienga Yamada-Taylor. Thanks very much. Um, very glad to be here. Tried to be here in October. I failed, so I'm here now. Um, just really quickly, I want to thank uh, TJ Demos, Debbie Gold, Evan Knight uh, for their um, persistent and patient efforts um, to get me to UC Santa Cruz. It's the first time I've been here and um, very glad to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes and I'm trying to weave together uh, three different um, aspects of uh, a story about Black Lives Matter. So um, I hope you stay with me. Uh, I always offer these talks in the spirit of uh, provocation in the best way, um, meant uh, provoking us to think together um, and to you know, talk uh, afterwards as a way of, of coming to some greater clarity about these very complicated issues. Uh, so with that, I'll get started. The autopsy report confirmed what her neighbors said happened in an apartment complex outside of Houston, Texas last May. Pamela Turner, a 44-year-old grandmother of three, sat on the ground trying to locate the humanity of the police officer who stood over her. She screamed that she was pregnant. Officer Juan de la Cruz, ignoring her pleas, stepped back, unholstered his gun, squeezing the trigger five times. Three bullets from his gun ripped, into the body, ripped through the body of Pamela Turner, ending her life. One bullet entered her left cheek, shattering her face. Another bullet tore through her left chest, and the last shredded her abdomen. Her life cut down by the police, manner of death, homicide. What happened after had been well rehearsed many times before. The police put Dela Cruz on a mandatory three-day administrative paid leave. The family secured the services of civil rights attorney Benjamin Crump. The Reverend Al Sharpton delivered the eulogy and a well-organized and well-attended demonstration forced the police to extend their comments beyond the typical talking points. Five years after the streets of Ferguson, Missouri erupted in a spasm of black rage and rebellion, many thousands more have gone. 
Since 2014, police across the United States have killed more than 3,000 people, a quarter of them African American. Five years later, do Black Lives Matter? Confronted by an array of internal and external obstacles, the movement has stalled, even as white supremacists rule from the perch of the White House. The murder of Mike Brown Jr. in the Ferguson uprising it inspired cracked open a period of organizing and protest that boldly aimed to end the reign of police terror in black, poor, and working class communities in cities and suburbs around the country. For those who think that the ki this kind of language is hyperbole, consider the conclusions reached by a 2016 Chicago Police Commission formed by former Mayor Rahm Emanuel after the vicious murder of 16-year-old uh, black teenager Laquan McDonald by the Chicago police. The report, the official report, read, quote, in part, the outrage about the killing of Laquan McDonald exposed deep and long-standing fault lines between black and Latino communities on the one hand and the police on the other, arising from police shootings to be sure, but also the daily pervasive transgressions that prevent people of all ages, races, ethnicities, and gender <coughs> across Chicago from having basic freedom of movement in their own neighborhoods. Stop without justification, verbally and physically abused, and in some instances arrested and then detained without counsel. Chicago Police Department's own data gives validity to the widely held belief the police have no regard for the sanctity of life when it comes to people of color. The report itself was evidence of the tremendous pressure generated by movement activists with a Democratic president in office on the eve of a historic election. Black voters had made Obama president, and if the party had any hopes of maintaining its grip on the presidency, they needed, to at, least, they needed at least the appearance of progress for the new movement decrying police abuse. Because what had started as a local movement in 2014 to secure the arrest and indictment of a cop in Ferguson soon erupted into a much broader national movement accelerated by the universal experience of black, vic black people victimized by violent policing. A grand jury's failure to indict the officer who killed Mike Brown Jr. in Ferguson was followed by the failure of a grand jury to indict the New York cop Michael Pantaleo, even as millions of people had watched him choke Eric Garner to death on the streets of Staten Island. In a stupor of rage and disbelief, where hope shattered like glass hitting the hard ground, the experiences of police abuse and intimidation united young black people around the country. The watersheds of Ferguson, Cleveland, Los Angeles, Staten Island, and countless others fed the streams that became Black Lives Matter in the late fall and young winter of 2014 and 15. In December of 2014, tens of thousands of people across the country participated in acts of nonviolent civil disobedience. Lawyers, doctors, college students, high school students, nurses, professional athletes, and ordinary people. On December 13, 2014, 50,000 people marched through the streets of New York with chants that connected Ferguson to New York City and then to the nation. Hands up, don't shoot. I can't breathe. Black Lives Matter. There were protests across the nation in cities large and small, and these scattered demonstrations cohered through the chant, demand, declaration, Black Lives Matter, in ways similar to the cry of freedom now during the civil rights movement. When the professional pungentry declared that the movement was dead after the predictable backlash of police unions and other law and order types, an uprising in Baltimore spilled into the streets with black children exhausted from the weight of institutional neglect and the raw racism that lies beneath lead poisoning, poverty, and charter schools in that city. The movement was barely ever alive if it, <coughs> the movement was barely ever alive if it were only measured by the number of organizations it sprouted. 
but it thrived in the hearts and minds of young black people who ached to be heard and seen. The emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement was critical to expanding our understanding of the deeply systemic, racist, abusive, and exploitive nature of American policing. The movement showed us the limits of reform and why we must consider the words of Martin Luther King Jr. from 1968 when he described as the necessity of a radical reconstruction of the United States if we were to ever truly live in a just, free, and democratic society. In an essay written by King that was published one year after his assassination, he wrote of the centrality of the African-American struggle to this process of what he called radical reconstruction. He wrote, quote, in these trying circumstances, the black revolution is much more than the struggle for the rights of Negroes. It is forcing America to face all of its interrelated flaws, racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. It is exposing the evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals systemic rather than superficial flaws and suggests that the radical reconstruction of society itself is the real issue to be faced. An examination of the Black Lives Matter movement allows us to do three things. It helps us reject the romantic delusions of the past while also exposing the interrelated flaws of racism, poverty, materialism, and militarism in U.S. society today. Finally, it shows us the explanatory power of social movements, but also the limits of reform in a society where oppression and exploitation are so embedded that they are constitutive of the society itself. For many white people and much of the liberal establishment, there appeared to be genuine shock at the anger and uprising as it, at the anger and uprising as it unfolded in Ferguson. In the years just prior to this uprising, the U.S. had been roiled by protests arising from police brutality, including the national campaign that brought people together to pursue the arrest of George Zimmerman, who had murdered Trayvon Martin in 2012. The protest on behalf of Trayvon Martin had come on the heels of an FBI crackdown on the Occupy uh, Wall Street encampments across the country. The emergence of the Occupy movement itself was evidence of the swelling disappointment with the Obama administration. But Ferguson protests had fatally pierced the media narrative of the racial progress assumed with the ascension of Barack Obama. In the weeks and months following the election of Obama in 2008, the question, that, the, the question was, had the United States become post-racial? It is hard to even believe that such a discussion was possible, given that we now have a white supremacist in the White House. But many people mistook the symbolic value of having a black president with the tangible, measurable progress made by the vast majority of African Americans. Residential segregation in the U.S. hides many of the harsh realities that working class and poor black people contend with on a daily basis. And while disproportionate rates of poverty and unemployment are always ready to be analyzed, <clears throat> the more pervasive reality that almost all poor and working black that working class black communities exist under police occupation and police state-like condition goes without comment. So while white people may have been shocked when Ferguson exploded, most black people knew it was just a matter of time. But especially for young black people, for whom the enormous contradictions between having mobilized and voted like they had never voted before to deliver an election to a black president, and yet Trayvon Martin was murdered in cold blood. Tamir Rice, a child shot down by police within a few seconds of their arrival to his location in a city park. One week earlier in Cleveland, Tanisha Anderson, unarmed and body slammed to the ground by police, killing her. Eric Garner, choked to death. John Crawford, 22 years old, standing in a Walmart, shot to death by police. This was the, zoo, the, this was the new reality. 
Even as Barack Obama pined on endlessly about the greatness and uniqueness of the United States, a country he repeatedly said was the only one where his story was possible, even as Barack Obama embraced almost biblically the greatness of American freedom and democracy, black men, women, and children were being killed by those sworn to uphold the laws of this country. And the inability of anyone to meaningfully address these contradictions, how can this be the best place on earth when 12-year-old black boys are murdered by agents of the state, fueled a deep sense of anger and resentment, but also perpetuated a sense of exclusion and marginality? Working class and poor African Americans lifted the cloak on police abuse and violence and exposed its connection to wider systemic flaws. Ferguson exposed how policing could be used to discipline black people generally with the threat of physical or economic violence. We learned that the Ferguson police, and police in fact throughout Missouri, saw black people, the arrest or punishment of black people as a source of revenue to offset taxing white people. The protest revealed how thousands of black people were entrapped by a system of legal fees and fines because they were seen as civically and socially disposable. In the eyes of the law and the legislators, the law was beholden to. Black lives did not matter. They treated African Americans in ways that they could not get away with treating most white people. The heroism of Ferguson was rooted in the ways that they overcame the fear that had been instilled by the ruthless and racist treatment by police for generations. In doing so, <coughs> their protests, their uprising, generated an enormous sense of solidarity. The Ferguson Rebellion showed what real democracy could look like when they refused to acquiesce to the chorus of, liberal, uh, of liberals and Democratic Party operatives who told them to get off the streets. For them and for us, democracy would be forged in the freedom of the street, the street meetings, the night marches, the demonstrations themselves. But no movement continues because it should or even because its cause is righteous. The rise or fall of a movement is ultimately determined by a tricky calculus combining strategy, tactics, politics, moves, and counter moves. The Black Lives Matter movement always faced two external challenges, not including the internal struggles that every movement wrestles with. Externally, the movement had to endure the way that its mere existence had become a rallying point for the consolidation of the varied strands of the white supremacist and white nationalist of the right. For the most visible activists, that meant dealing with credible death threats, along with the more typical variety of racist, sexist, transphobic, and nationalist harassment on a daily basis. Early on, candidate Trump had made Black Lives Matter, his enemy, declaring the group to be terrorists and activists connected to the, to, the or, to the organizing to be terrorists as well, and pledging his unwavering support to police. And the FBI, true to its history, began surveilling black activists and, vent, and inventing new political categories along the way to communicate this supposed new hazard, referring to black activists as black identity extremists. It wasn't surprising, but it was exhausting, and for many, it could be scary. When Trump decided to make BLM the foil to his white supremacist candidacy by making naked appeals to law and order, aligning his campaign to the Blue Lives Matter hysteria, it put activists and organizations in the crosshairs. But what may have been even trickier to navigate was the way that the Democratic political establishment, the Democratic Party political establishment, sought to divide the movement between pragmatists and those who were rapidly radicalizing in the face of intransigent police brutality and misconduct. The Obama administration had a virtual open door policy when it came to activists. Their strategy was to paint a picture where activity and busyness looked like progress. 
This meant having regular contact and periodic meetings with activists, empaneling a national policing commission, and empowering, empowering the Department of Justice to initiate investigations and compile reports on egregious police departments. And yet throughout this flurry of busyness, it was hard to grasp what was changing, what the actual impact was. The urgency with which the Democratic Party wanted to resolve these issues so that liberals and progressives, including activists, could then turn their full attention to the 2016 presidential election, meant that the liberal establishment constantly questioned the motives, structure, and demands of the movement in hopes of moving things along. Who are your leaders? What are your demands? Give us a solution, were some of the questions or accusations directed at the most visible leaders of the movement. Reflecting the influence of non-governmental organizations' efficiency and measurable success methods of organizing, there was urgency in coming up with solutions or policy initiatives as a real and measurable way to confront the issues with policing. When some activists chafed at this particular framing, they were attacked as purists. For example, when an activist, a black woman from Chicago, named Aslan Pulley from, refused to go to a closed door meeting at the White House because she doubted the sincerity of the Obama administration, President Barack Obama personally called her out. Obama said publicly, quote, you can't just keep on yelling at them and you can't refuse to meet because that might compromise the purity of your position. The value of social movements and activism is to get you at the table, get you in the room, and then start trying to figure out how is this problem going to be solved. You then have a responsibility to prepare an agenda that is achievable, that can institutionalize the changes you seek, and to engage the other side. But for many activists, their thought process was more complicated. To be sure, the Black Lives Matter movement was not uniform in its thinking, strategy, or tactics. And those divergent ideas about political objectives and the process through which, through which the movement should arrive at those decisions were deeply contested within the movement. For some, they welcomed a seat at the most ta powerful table in the world, that of the White House. They welcomed the access and believed that it meant that they were getting a hearing at the highest level of government. Brittany Packnett, who was active in St. Louis and Ferguson in 2014, explained why she and others participated in this meeting with Obama. Quote, to gain the liberation we seek, there remain many critical moments for action and we are wise not to limit the legitimate ones. Our fights will never be won at the policy table alone. Protesters assume risk, build organic democratic accountability in the streets, and force organized tactics to take hold. Organizers mobilize the people with strategic and direct action to push systemic change in institutions and policies. Policymakers and institutional leaders are influenced by all manner of people continuing to mount pressure in every possible space to see lasting change. She continued, I believe this movement's collective varied work can and has moved mountains, but it will take every one of us and every tactic at our disposal to win the freedom we seek. For others, there were misgivings. Aslan Pulley, the working class black woman from Chicago that Obama had personally chastised for refusing to take part in the meeting, had a vastly different vision of change compared to the one offered by the President of the United States. She wrote in an open letter a response to his criticism of her. Pulley wrote, quote, I could not, with any integrity, participate in such a sham that would only serve to legitimize the false narrative that the government is working to end police brutality and the institutional racism that fuels it. 
for the increasing number of families fighting for justice and dignity, for their kin slain by police. I refuse to give its perpetrators and enablers political cover by making an appearance among them. We assert that true revolutionary and systemic change will ultimately only be brought forth by working people, students, and youth, organizing, marching, and taking power from the corporate elites. The point here is not whether one point of view was more correct than the other. The reality is that all social movements are expressions of the deep desire for change or reform of the current situation. For Black Lives Matter, that could be expressed as the hope that the police would, quote, stop killing us. But ultimately, it was a movement to reform the status quo of policing. But what often happens in these movements is that through the course of events, movement participants begin to, become, begin to come to radically different conclusions about what their objectives should be. For many BLM activists, they begin to reach a conclusion that the police could not actually be reformed, which then put them into conflict with the reform nature of the movement itself. What turned into a bigger problem was the inability for the tension between reform and revolution, or more crudely, between body cameras or prison abolition, to find the space to be debated or worked out within the movement. All movements are confronted with the existential debates concerning their viability and longevity. There are always crucial decisions to be made concerning their direction and the best route to get there. But without the opportunity and space to collectively assess, discuss, or even think about what the movement is or what it should be, those untended debates and conversations can corrode. But beyond the movement, Obama's intervention showed that much of the criticism was about curtailing the deepening radical conclusions many activists were reaching. This included calls for abolishing police, prisons, and demands for a massive redistribution of wealth and resources from the rich to the working class. In many ways, you could see how the Black Lives Matter movement contributed to the conditions that gave rise to the viability of Bernie Sanders' candidacy. And this was the real problem with the movement for the Democratic Party and their liberal supporters. In 1964, political activist and strategist Bayard Rustin argued that the civil rights movement and the new emergence of black uprisings in that year must be prepared to shift from what he described, protest to politics. He argued, quote, it is clear that Negro needs cannot be satisfied unless we go beyond what has so far been placed on the agenda. How are these radical objectives to be achieved? The answer is simple, deceptively so, through political power. We are challenged now to broaden our social vision to develop functional programs with concrete objectives. Rustin was suggesting that the shift into formal politics marked a kind of political, a sign of political maturity and offered an opportunity to deliver much more substantive change to black communities than protest alone could ever deliver. In many ways, this was a reasonable proposition Indeed, Rustin argued for this approach in 1964, and this was very much the trajectory black politics evolved along. One could say that the election of Barack Obama in 2008 was the culmination of that strategy, from protest to a black president. But Obama's scold and Pulley's response revealed more than strategic loggerheads on the objective of social movements. The Black Lives Matter movement also exposed deep and bitter divisions within black politics. While it was true that some of the rancor was evident of a generational divide that had come to emphasize the role of voting over activism as the most consequential way to transform black life in the US. But it was also evidence of a deepening class divide within black communities. Some activists chafed at the paternalism that flowed through the Obama administration, such as when he would rebuke black voters by claiming not to be black America's president, 
while simultaneously code switching into Ebonics to chastise African Americans to get out to vote. But it wasn't just Obama. His race antics were a bitter reminder of the ways that black elected officials often fattened themselves up, munching at the trough of black votes, only to deliver little other than themselves alone as tokens of alleged racial progress. But the reality was that in many cities, black mayors, black city council people, black police chiefs, and black police officers managed the inequality and oppressive conditions that ignited movements locally. The brutal racism of Donald Trump's description of Baltimore as a, quote, rat-infested den where, quote, no human being wants to live has helped to obscure the ways that local and national black elected officials have betrayed many of their black constituents by way of institutional neglect and then relying on utterly brutal and sadistic police to, demand, to manage the ensuing crisis. Trump's open appeals to racism have cast a long shadow over the underwhelming record of Barack Obama that contributed in 2016 to the lowest turnout of black voters in a presidential election in 20 years. We should do well to remember this as the, when the banal and underwhelming normal uh, returned, uh, it, we should do well to remember that this is the banal and underwhelming normal that some would like to return to. This is how the focus on electoral politics, especially coming out of Black Lives Matter, can underestimate the ways that social movements, along with protest and demonstrations, have been fundamental to achieving what we consider to be progress in this country. In the 1960s, when African Americans were almost completely locked out of positions of power, it could make sense that the next step was electoral politics. But then and now, the pivot to elections can distract from the important task of building big, broad, multiracial social movements to not only, in this instance, fight against Trumpism, but to also fight for the things that we want. It does not mean that the looming election or other electoral contests are unimportant, but it is the social movement that functions as a mechanism that can preserve the interests of those outside of the corrupting and tranquilizing influence of electoral politics and, and political office. The transformative power of the social movement is not only about its coercive influence in policymaking or the governing institutions of this country, generally speaking, but we must also consider the power of collective organizing and movements on ourselves. The radical artist and critic John Berger in 1968 wrote of mass demonstrations, quote, theoretically, demonstrations are meant to reveal the strength of po popular opinion or feeling. Theoretically, they are an appeal to the democratic conscience of the state. In this sense, Berger wrote, the numbers present at the protest are significant not because of their impact on the state, but on those who participate, quote, the importance of the numbers involved is to be found in the direct experience of those taking part in or sympathetically witnessing the demonstration. For them, the numbers cease to be numbers and become the evidence of their senses, the conclusions of their imaginations. The larger the demonstration, the more powerful and immediate, visible, audible, tangible a metaphor it becomes for their total collective strength. The point is that movements not only create the possibility of changing our material conditions by exerting the force of many upon the intransigence of the few, but social movements create arenas where we ourselves can be transformed. The mass movement breaks us from the isolation of everyday life. In this society that deifies the lie of rugged individualism, the idea the idea that wrongly attributes our successes to our personal ingenuity and blames our failures on personal weakness and defect. The mass movement, that arena of struggle, brings us together to share in our failure and show our connection and relationship to each other. 
The prevailing ideas in our society reinforce a sense of fragmentation and disconnection. But struggle shows what we have in common. It pierces the prevailing common sense about our society and creates the conditions for, the potential for solidarity. What you see is not what you get. We have to reject the simplicity and common sense of impressionism. We must challenge the simple narratives fed to us intended to make sense of the world that we live in. The black radical feminist and organizer Ella Baker understood this. She wrote that if we were serious about transforming society, then we must understand society. And if we are to understand society, we must look more deeply and not accept at face value what we are told to be true. She said in 1969, quote, in order for us as poor and oppressed people to become a part of society, to become a part of society that is meaningful, the system under which we now exist has to be radically changed. This means that we are going to have to learn to think in radical terms. I use the term radical in its original meaning, she said, getting down to and understanding the root cause. It means facing a system that does not lend itself to your needs and devising means by which you change that system. Black Lives Matter has opened the possibility, but also raised more questions. What does the, sh what does the shattered face of Pamela Turner, exploded by the policeman's bullet, tell us, not just about Black Lives Matter, but what does it tell us about the United States right now? It tells us how absolutely central policing remains to maintaining the racist, sexist, unequal status quo. Police unions and elected officials like to portray policing as dangerous, as some kind of bizarre last line of defense between us and a murky, menacing criminal element or simple disorder out there. In reality, most policing involves surveilling and harassing poor and working class people. When black and brown people are overrepresented among the ranks of the poor and working class, those people bear the brunt of the encounters with the police. Being killed by the police is a leading cause of death for young black men. Sociologist Frank Edwards has said that young black men have, quote, better odds of being killed by police than winning a lot of scratch-off lottery games. Pamela Turner, who suffered from schizophrenia, was in the crosshairs of the local police because of several minor infractions that brought her into contact with them. Last April, when she was served with an eviction notice that resulted in a criminal mischief charge, that led to the encounter with the same cop who eventually killed her two weeks, or, uh, uh, two weeks later. Policing is the last public sector service that our government employs as it defunds and neglects all other aspects of the civic infrastructure. As public institutions across the country are denuded, hundreds of millions of dollars are unearthed almost miraculously to pay off police brutality and police murder lawsuits. The city of Chicago alone has spent over $800 million since 2004 to settle lawsuits for police brutality and wrongful death claims. The NYPD has averaged $100 million uh, settlements for police brutality and wrongful, and wrongful death suits a year, $100 million a year over the last decade to settle these claims. Last year, the New York, New York City paid $232 million to settle police brutality claims. In 2007, they paid $302 million. From 2010 to 2016, in 10 of the 10 largest American cities, there was a 48% increase in the dollar amount of money paid to settle lawsuits or satisfy court judgments in police misconduct cases. Recognizing the determined duration of police abuse and violence is less about pessimism than it is about sobriety. There is no quick fix to police brutality. It is so difficult to fight because the bipartisan political establishment needs it, especially when the political establishment decides that it has nothing left to give to the public. 
It took five long and deadly years for the officials who allegedly managed the New York City Police Department to fire the police officer who choked the life of a man who said 11 times, I can't breathe, before he collapsed in death under the weight of Daniel Pantaleo. It took five years for the Department of Justice to decide that it would not bring federal civil rights charges against Pantaleo as if his illegal chokehold that took Eric Garner's life was not the textbook definition of a civil rights violation. In the wake of such obvious and willful flouting of one's individual right to life freely, in the name of protecting the rule of law, the ways in which the law itself reflects what is valued by the elite while ignoring what is valued by most of us is exposed. In other words, the inherent malleability of the law recognized and saw Pantaleo while it obliterated Eric Garner. That neither the law nor law enforcement is on our side ultimately makes the movements to reform either extremely difficult. It is usually the case then that we get, to the, we get the kind of change we desire when we pressure, coerce the political class, their establishment, their legal institutions, to see and hear us. And to do that, it matters how we organize, what we think, what we demand, what we imagine, and what we hope for. In some ways, these are key values for any social movement. Democracy, where we see all of our aspirations and failures, our endeavors as entwined, connected, means trying to bring in as many as possible and figuring out how to make it work. Black lives can matter, but it will demand a struggle not only to change the police, but to change the world that relies on police to manage it, its unequal distribution of the things that we need to survive. In that sense, Black Lives Matter has exposed police brutality as something deeper and more pernicious in American society. It has also emboldened a generation of young people to want and demand more. We have to use that as an opportunity to see how the racism that allows for the existence of violent and abusive policing also allows for the subjugation of undocumented immigrants, who in turn are also subjected to a kind of violent and abusive policing at the border and throughout this country. The billions of dollars dedicated to policing social crises should compel us to ask whether this money could be spent creating a more equitable society. And that is a struggle that has the power to unite our various struggles. In doing so, we must resist the insidious debates that pit identity against class as the main dividing line. In many ways, it is a ludicrous debate that ignores that the vast majority of ordinary black and brown people are working class, and thus class issues are identity issues. The struggle for a living wage, affordable health care, well-funded public schools, eviction, against evictions, foreclosures, housing insecurity, hunger, are issues that are of disproportionate concern to black and brown families. And so, it, and so is this ongoing struggle to end police abuse and, and uh, police abuse and violence. These are not abstract debates of whether race is more important than class or if class is more important than race. In fact, race is the way that class inequality is mediated or managed in American capitalism. The political establishment and the, ruling, the American ruling class consciously use a racially inflected concept of meritocracy to hide or obscure the obscene degree of class inequality in this country. This doesn't make class more important or race less important. Instead, it demonstrates that here, the two are inextricable. Economic anxiety has always been refracted through the lens of race in the US. It is almost never by accident, but the elite almost always cultivate it. And if you think that economic anxiety experienced within working class white communities is just an excuse to be racist, it is only because the obscene material deprivation in this country is so hidden from view. Our country celebrates the rich, 
the beautiful and the famous, while simultaneously ignoring and erasing the daily struggles of ordinary people. And as more ordinary white people become visible markers of the failure of, ca of capitalism, conservatives increasingly blame white poverty and social crisis, most notably drug addiction, on a morality crisis. Charles Murray, who became famous by blaming black poverty on a biological disposition to behavior that results in poverty, wrote a book in 2012 called Coming Apart, The State of White America. And in it, he blamed declines in white working class standards of living on high divorce rates, out of wedlock births, dwindling church attendance, and men who can't hold jobs. Murray, in effect, substituted poor and working class whites with the African Americans he used 30 years, 30 years ago to make the same exact argument. He rehashes the same ideas to analyze white poverty and also concludes that low IQ and biology are factors in white poverty. But instead of the biological difference being between blacks and whites, they are now between rich and poor white people. But perhaps the most succinct contempt for poor and working class white people came from an article written by Kevin Williams, Williamson and published by the conservative journal National Review. It read in part, quote, if you spend time in hard scrabble white upstate New York or eastern Kentucky or my own native West Texas, and you take an honest look at the welfare dependency and drug and alcohol addiction, the family anarchy, which is to say the whelping of human children with all the respect and wisdom of a stray dog, you will come to an awful realization. It wasn't Beijing, it wasn't Washington, even as bad as Washington can be. Nothing happened to them. There wasn't some awful disaster, there wasn't a war or famine or a plague or a foreign occupation. Even the economic changes of the past few decades do very little to explain the dysfunction and negligence and the incomprehensible malice of poor white America. The truth about these dysfunctional downscale communities is that they deserve to die. Economically, they are a negative asset, Morally, they are indefensible. The white American underclass is enthralled to a vicious, selfish culture whose main products are misery and used heroin needles. Donald Trump's speeches make them feel good. So does Oxycontin. Of course, liberals don't provide a credible alternative to this uniquely American cruelty when they parrot the same contempt by reducing the experiences of ordinary white people to privilege in ways that do not resemble and certainly do not make sense of the actual experiences of working class white people. There are 20 million poor white people in this country. The imprisonment of white women is surging at, even, at rates even higher than for black women. And according to recent reports over the last year, it is largely driven by growing alcohol abuse and drug addiction. Indeed, the life expectancy for working class white women has de 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 decreased for two years in a row. This is unprecedented in the, in the developed world. This is unprecedented in a so-called first world country, the reversal of life expectancy. Life in poor and working class white enclaves is increasingly defined by economic insecurity, alcoholism, opioid addiction, and suicide. And while it is important to point out how elected officials are very willing to paint a sympathetic picture of opioid addiction as a healthcare crisis and not a criminal issue, as they did with the crack phenomenon in the 1980s and 19, in the 1990s, because opioids have had a discernible impact on white people and crack was centered in black neighborhoods. I would caution against believing all of the rhetoric that opioid addicts are getting love and attention from the government. Two years ago, for example, in Middleton, Ohio, a town of 50,000 people, that's 87% that's 87 white, 532 people died of opioid overdose. A person on the city council proposed that drug addicts get two opportunities for medical treatment in the event of an overdose. 
But if there was a third call for an ambulance or medical treatment because of an overdose, there should be no response. The councilman said the drug was too expensive at $36 a dosage. This is not white privilege. This is capitalism in its most savage form. The point of this is not to deny that racism exists among working class or poor white people, nor is it to suggest that these issues affect black, white, and Latinx people in the same way. They do not. Race and gender and national status and sexual orientation among many, these always compound and interlock with each other, creating even more profound means of suffering. Nor is it to deny that millions of ordinary white people who did vote for Trump were motivated by racism. So the point is not to deny the reality of the depths of racism in our society. It is to understand why it exists and to raise questions as to whether or not it can be challenged or changed. I believe that racism is ideological with material manifestations, but it is not immutable. To believe that racism is unchanging leaves one with the difficult task of explaining the historic transformations of the United States in the last 100 years. Of course, it is easy to uniformly dismiss ordinary white workers as hopelessly racist, but in doing so, we may uniformly give up the chance or potential to build a genuine mass movement that can fundamentally change this country. And we need that kind of movement because the crisis that we face extend beyond the capabilities of our two-party system. For those who long to, for a return of the good old days when Obama was president or when Democrats controlled Congress, they do so by forgetting or ignoring the tremendous continuity in racism, police abuse, poverty, suffering, and oppression that came long before the Trump administration. From a relatively recent history of Hillary Clinton's description of black children as super predators, to Bill Clinton's promise to end welfare as we know it, to Barack Obama's description of the young rebels in the Baltimore uprising as thugs, the Democratic Party is not averse to also using racism to advance a political agenda for them and not us. It is also true that there are better or worse elected officials but what can never be forgotten is that in the constant weighing of who or what party is the greater or lesser evil, we never engage with the larger issue of how we get free. It is no mystery why socialism is, not, is no longer a dirty word in the United States. It's no mystery why in 2016, 13 million people voted for an open socialist, Bernie Sanders. It's no mystery why he is a legitimate leading contender for the Democratic Party's nomination in 2020. Not only are these all indictments of capitalism's failure, but in 2016 and now, it is also an express desire for a better way. It was the essence, and it continues to be, the essence in some ways of hope. We want real democracy, where the people who create the wealth in the society are entitled to have a say in how it is distributed. We want real freedom, freedom from racism, imprisonment, borders, detention, and second-class personhood. It is something that no party can deliver. It is something that people have to fight for. The best of the black radical tradition has always understood that black liberation, the notion that black people can live free of physical, economic, social coercion, cannot be achieved within capitalism. The dialectic of reform and revolution cannot be unleashed by privileging one above the other. Instead, the fight for our daily lives is a precondition for imagining a different world altogether. Black Lives Matter as a belief, an utterance, a collective chant, and a possibility is an example of this. From Ferguson to the Baltimore Rebellion, the commitment, solidarity, and struggles of young black people provided a glimpse of freedom to those living under the policeman's boot for their entire lives. But those struggles are only the beginning. The Black Women's Manifesto, published in 1970 by the Third World Women's Alliance, described how we go from the struggles of one to the struggles of many. Quote, 
The new world that we are struggling to create must destroy oppression of any type. The value of this new system will be determined by the status of those persons who are presently most oppressed. The low man on the totem pole, unless women in any enslaved nation are completely liberated, the change cannot really be called a revolution. A people's revolution that engages the participation of every member of the community, including men and women, bring about a certain transformation in the participants as a result of this participation. Once you have caught a glimpse of freedom or tasted a bit of self-determination, you can't go back to the old routines that were established under a racist capitalist regime. Another world is possible, but we are the only ones who can create it. No one is coming to save us. We must join together to save ourselves. Thank you. Now I'm going to talk some more. <laughs> I know, I feel kind of bad that you have to talk some more. <laughs> Ask a really long question. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe one more round of applause because I was amazed at that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you here, Kananda, uh, here at UC Santa Cruz. And we had a, in, we, our engagement in activism in Chicago mm -hmm. allowed us to, our, our paths to cross a number of times. Um, and it turns out that we also trained at the same karate dojo. Um, <laughs> so it's really a pleasure to have you here. Very glad um, to be here. And your talk, the th one of the things that's just so incredibly refreshing about it is in this moment where partisanship mm -hmm. has absolutely truncated our political horizons mm -hmm. so that everybody is solely thinking about, you know, that because of Trump and his incredible mm -hmm. his heinousness in every way, um, there's this nostalgia for mm -hmm. Obama. And... Maybe we could actually just begin there. I'm, I know you've gotten pushback um, for things that you have said about Trump. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you also get pushback for your searing critique of Obama. And, and mm -hmm. that critique came out today, but it's also in your books. Mm -hmm. um, and it's powerful and um, uh, really suggest something about the conditions of possibility mm -hmm. for Trump and the moment we're in lie mm -hmm. in some uh, large, to, la to a large extent with the Democratic Party. Right. Um, so if you could say something about whether you get some pushback and... What do you um, I mean, just last night we were at an event where we heard yeah. some nostalgia for Obama, and it's understandable, you know, it's understandable why people would be nostalgic for him. Yeah, I was telling you that um, someone sent me a, uh, a picture of, in New York, they're selling $300 cashmere sweaters that say, I miss Obama, um, on, the, on the front of them. Um, I think, no, I actually, you know, I know that there is a contingent um, of, of people, there might be some people here, um, I don't know, uh, you know, for whom there's a really worked out argument for um, why Obama was not able to, uh, you know, accomplish all the things that, uh, you know, he sort of set out in um, 
his historic candidacy in, in 2007 and 2008. You know, and most of it is about the, um, uh, the Republicans, um, you know, who were undeniably racist and, and made a blood pact not to uh, allow him to pass um, any kind of meaningful um, uh, legislation. So I'm not, you know, I'm not in denial about uh, that. Um, but I'm, I'm looking more at the dynamic of what it meant for um, not just young black people, but I think black people in general to mobilize historically to uh, make him president and for him to then, you know, have as a running theme in his presidency that he's not the president of, of black America um, and using his position uh, to really preserve a space for some of the most nauseating racial stereotyping uh, of, of poor black people to demonstrate to a white public that he in fact was not um, a president for uh, African Americans. And I think that, um, you know, it depends on where you are, you know, but uh, you can actually have these conversations in some uh, African American um, uh, black spaces and people will agree with you even as, you know, people can tend to, you know, continue to defend uh, Obama um, uh, publicly. And so, you know, I like to be meticulous and, and careful uh, about how I make uh, these arguments. And, and really the response usually is, yeah, that's true. You know, and it might be, well, you know, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, you know, um, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I think it, it's, it's undeniable. And I was saying to you last night that, um, you know, Obama framed Hillary Clinton's run in 2016 as his third term, you know, and I think the, the fact that um, black turnout uh, was at a 20-year low, uh, even for, you know, people talked about the role of, of black women and mobilizing for Clinton. Uh, there was also a 6% drop off in um, registered black, you know, women voters uh, uh, who, you know, did not participate in the vote. And I think, you know, 100 million people didn't vote in what was framed as the most consequential uh, election of, of our lifetime. And, you know, it's easy and, and popular for liberals and, and the punditry to talk about how lazy or disconnected or disenchanted people are without really digging into the, the issues of, you know, what might motivate people to not be motivated to um, get out and vote. And if there is this continuity of, you know, debt and just a kind of hopelessness might be the extreme end, but just the feeling that everyone's in a rut and we're, we're on this earth to pay our debts and that's it. You know, that, that, that's a reality for um, a lot of people in this country. It's why the rates of suicide are rising. It's why the rates of uh, drug addiction and alcoholism are, I mean, suicide is the leading cause of death for black males 10 to 19, right? USA, USA, USA. And so that's the, the, the Trump stupidity prevents us from looking at that. It prevents us from looking at what the previous eight years did or didn't do. We can't, we can't even, you know, talk about it because, uh, you know, Trump is the devil and, you know, everything was, was not great, but it was okay. It wasn't okay. And that's how we got into this situation. Um, I have a question. I mean, one of the things that I love about your work is that you're a scholar and an activist and your work speaks so directly to mm -hmm. and draws from so much knowledge of activist scenes and contexts. And mm -hmm. so some of my questions in some ways are yeah. about that. 
And my, my, the, uh, one question is a curiosity, really, about what inspired you to write um, How We Get Free. Mm -hmm. And because, in addition to the fact that it was the 40th anniversary, right. in 2017, the 40th anniversary of the Kambahi River Collective Statement, um, but it also, um, and, and I don't know if people know, but in that book, Kianga uh, reprints the Kambahi River Statement um, and interviews three of the authors of the statement, Barbara Smith and Beverly Smith and Demita Frazier. And then there's some commentary from mm -hmm. the historian and activist Barbara Ransby and uh, Alicia, Black, Garza. And Alicia yeah. Garza. And then your introduction, which does all of this very important contextualizing and conceptual work, it mm -hmm. seemed to me. Um, but, and, and, and the statement itself introduces to the world, as you say, the idea of interlocking oppressions and the idea of identity politics. And I'm curious if, was what led you to decide to, to mm -hmm. kind of reprint that? And I was thinking about the kind of, was, it, was there something about the way that identity politics was kind of being mobilized mm -hmm. in that moment that you felt like you wanted to make a political intervention in some sense? Yeah, totally. Um, I, you know, I, I thought that um, one, and one thing that I noticed was people like to invoke um, Asada Shakur, uh, feminist and other um, political activists from the 1960s um, and 1970s in ways that, you know, I, I was I'm not always sure were consistent with uh, the politics that those people um, actually uh, embodied. And so as we were coming up to the 40th anniversary of the uh, Combahee Statement, which was a, a statement about um, black feminism written by this, uh, the, the members of this group, uh, the Combahee River Collective. Uh, the statement was published in 1977. And so in 2017, we were coming up to the anniversary. And so there were lots and lots of invocations of uh, Combahee as almost a kind of badge of uh, radicalism, um, but in ways that I thought uh, were not entirely consistent with um, what that statement seemed to represent. Um, but I wasn't 100% sure of that. And so I thought, you know, one way to um, figure that out was to actually interview uh, the women who wrote the statement to see how, what they thought about the statement at, at the time under which they wrote it, but also reflecting uh, 40 years later, um, uh, had their ideas changed about it, um, you know, ha had their political commitments shifted. Uh, so that was, that was one um, sort of big, big motivation. But also just even within that, you know, identity politics uh, and the way in which uh, the women of Combahee um, theorized it and, and conceptualized it in the 1970s you know, it has become a different thing. And to some extent, that, that, that's not really a story. I mean, um, you release language into the universe and, you know, in one historical moment, it can mean one thing and it changes, um, it changes over time. Um, but what I thought was uh, troubling, though, was that its meaning had eroded to such a degree that I felt like it was being used in ways that were actually antithetical um, to their political practice, which is, you know, if they talked about identity politics, meaning that your identity, um, black women's identity in particular, was a source of their political radicalization um, in the world, that uh, the, you know, oppression and exploitation that black women faced 
uh, was what was fueling their particular kind of radical um, politics. Uh, and so that, you know, and that was a, a positive thing. That wasn't something um, uh, that uh, they should be dissuaded from. And for Barbara Smith, she saw that uh, as a response to um, uh, the, the left that she was engaged with, that she felt in some ways many of them had a doctrinaire understanding of oppression um, and came uh, to their political conclusions in a very different way um, than the black women that she was organizing with. And the difference in that way created uh, obstacles between people that were not insurmountable, but that had to be clearly understood on their own terms in order for people to be able to overcome the differences between them. Um, and so this is very different from the idea that identity itself prevents you um, from being able to engage and struggle with people who have a different identity. Um, it's a very different idea than um, your identity is more important than someone else's uh, um, identity. And so central to the Combahee statement then um, is this concept of coalition um, politics, uh, which in, I read as solidarity in action, right? That um, you don't necessarily have to experience what someone else experiences in order to in, enter into struggle uh, with them. If we all see that regardless of our different positions um, uh, in, in terms of identity, that we all face some measure of oppression and exploitation within capitalism. And the, the point is to figure out um, collectively where, where are the intersections that might bring us together to form the kinds of movements and mobilizations that are necessary to challenge that. Um, and so for me, those, those were, even in the, the, the late 70s where, you know, there might not have been a whole lot to be hopeful uh, about if, if you lived through the, the sort of high arc of movement in 68, through the repression um, of the US government, and then through the, the collapse of, um, uh, of, of capitalism and the rollout of neoliberalism, um, that to me that still, the, the statement still reads as a, poli as, as a politics of hope um, and sobriety and seriousness um, and, and really grappling with um, uh, the, the difficulty of building the type of movement and struggles that are necessary to confront a system um, such as capitalism. And I, it, it just felt that there was a lot of invocation of these people and these politics, but without the same level um, of sobriety, of seriousness, um, and of, of really grappling in the ways that they did with um, a very complicated uh, social milieu, but that was still necessary to engage with nonetheless. Yeah, and I mean, in the intro, you do a lot of work to kind of emphasize the way that they were trying to deepen mm -hmm. socialist politic. And you're talk, you said before about being careful in your choice of words, and I noticed in the introduction, there are a lot of moments where you kind of reading the statements suggests that they understood that this these experiences of oppression, black women's experiences mm -hmm. in particular, created an opportunity for a radicalization. Mm -hmm. There was no kind of necessary, there was no guarantee of right. that, but it created that opportunity. So there's a, uh, the identity and the politics are, there's the possible linkage, right. but not a given. And right, which is also, I think that sometimes today, that we think that experience alone, the lived experience of um, people who are uh, oppressed um, in this society is enough in and of itself to to stand in as an analysis of what the source of that oppression is, but more importantly, what you do about it. Um, and I think, you know, what that statement the Combahee statement is reflective 
um, of is no, that you actually need politics yeah. and you need analysis. Yeah. And if we look today, you know, one of the, the stark differences between now and then is not just the, what I talked about, referred to in the talk as the kind of acceleration of class tensions or differences among African Americans, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's small and, and can't be overemphasized, but the, the emergence of a, a kind of middle-class black feminism, right, that is, is led and championed by someone like Michelle uh, Obama. And, and so if we were just dealing with, well, the experience, you know, experience of racism uh, uh, and, and, and sexism alone uh, means that we don't really need um, politics or, or an, an analysis, then I'm not sure where that would, would leave us with the Oprahs and the, the Michelle Obamas um, uh, of the world. Um, and so I feel like the, the statement anticipates in some ways uh, these kinds of, of developments. And that actually, if I, for me, the, the main thing was is that if we really engage this statement, it, it's very rich, it has an incredible amount of, of depth uh, to it, and that we should like really engage it and not just, you know, name drop yeah. Combahee, yeah. you know, without actually getting into what, what they were talking about. I'm gonna ask one more question sure. and then open it up. Um, in the, you, you mentioned in your talk, and it's in your books as well, um, this, the shift in black politics mm -hmm. from protest to politics, to electoral politics, and you do a great job of showing how uh, the limits of an electoral strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and you also um, suggest something, you, you talk about the different moments when the black liberation movement gets stirred into action, it often provokes crises mm -hmm. that are incredibly generative and, and full of possibility. Right. Um, and, um, all of, and all of that is, is really um, great, and it suggests something about, and, and then you spoke about this tonight again, the kind of, dis, you know, the vital importance of disruption and militancy and so on for any kind of social change mm -hmm. to happen. And, um, and, and also the centrality of the black movement in any real social transformation that would happen in this country. So the centrality of a, of mm -hmm. a black movement in an anti-capitalist movement, in any anti-capitalist movement um, in this country. And so, I don't know, all of that, I, you know, is really compelling to me and makes me think about um, the importance, the limits of electoral politics and mm -hmm. the importance of disruption. And we are in the midst of, as TJ said, of this wildcat strike here, mm -hmm. um, the graduate student, students doing this great strike. And it's, it's um, been interesting, and I think you're very familiar with this, and I'm very familiar with this, where... Um, it happened to act up all the time mm -hmm. that we were constantly criticized by the gay community, but by the mainstream media, by politicians, by everybody, uh, you know, ah, they really are kind of like, they really shouldn't have done that, that taking over of the Golden Gate Bridge, or they really shouldn't have, you know, they kind of, they don't really know what they're doing, and they're kind of... Um, and so here we are in this great strike, and there's a lot of solidarity. I, I would say there's a lot of support for the demand for mm -hmm. cola, but mm -hmm. there's you'll hear a lot of tut tutting about the tactics, kind of like oh, I don't think they should have done that. And anyway, I just was I just wanted mm -hmm. to to note that and the the standard ways in which movements are constantly. Um, they, they, appear, they are depicted as not really knowing how to do this and they don't know things so well and, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I don't know, if you have some thoughts about that? that I mean, with, <laughs> with ACT UP, you know, it's like... <laughs> you have, I think we yeah. have some wild cats <laughs> in the audience. I know, I had to make sure TJ and I were talking. I was like, there are no picket lines, right? <laughs> because this would be a problem. Um, 
I, with with ACT UP, you know, it's like, well, how many more people need to die? Yeah, I mean, before you people, people decide alive? something, how right? Many people are alive right. because of disruption. And I think, you know, with with the the wildcat here and and labor in general, <laughs> would it Fred, Frederick Douglass say, "Power concedes nothing without um, a demand"? And and so, you know, people are often put into, into these positions because the um, status quo and the defenders of the status quo, meaning the administrative bodies, you know, drag their feet. They always promise to look into things, to set up another That's fucking awesome. commission, you know, to <laughs> investigate, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and meanwhile, people are actually trying to pay the rent, right? People are trying to, like, you know... Um, figure out how to, to, to make the ends meet from one, uh, from one week to the next. And you get to the point where, you know, the time for studying and investigating um, has passed and we need action. And apparently the only thing that motivates you people to act, you know, is the withdrawal of labor. I mean, it's, it's, this is strife 101, right? And so, um, you know, I think that that moment comes in, um, in many struggles. And it, it's not to say that it's the same tactic at, at all times. I mean, one of the things that I was trying to, uh, to talk about was, you know, that movements and, and demonstrations, strikes, these are organic um, uh, uh, things. Corruption. Yeah, Corruption. that... Yeah that they have, they have a life and that it means that you have to be responsive to its particular conditions and situations, which means it's rarely one size you know, fits all or one thing fits uh, uh, every situation. So that means that there has to be a constant uh, engagement with the people who are involved, that there has to be democracy in, in democratic discussion and input, that people have to vote on things and to be held accountable, you know, for decisions uh, uh, that are made, which means that people make different decisions, tactical and strategic decisions, um, based on uh, new situations that arise. Um, but the point is that, you know, is to act and to be engaged and you know, to understand the dynamics of the particular struggle uh, that you're in so that to the best of your ability, you make the right decision, you know, at the, at the right time, um, which, you know, sounds like is, is happening here. Um, so, you know, I'm, I congratulate you on your uh, struggle and hope that the uh, administration comes to their senses and, you know, pays people what, what they deserve to be paid in order to do the work that they, you know, want done. And in order to live. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Thanks. Um, okay, so we have time for a number of uh, questions. So raise your hands high, and I think people are running around with um, microphones. Let's see. Okay, right there. Yes, you. Yes. And here comes a microphone. And, and they're actually recording this, and as a result, uh, we need to, you have to speak into the microphone. Do you, could you speak to the role that art plays in disruption and in what, all that you're talking about? Do you have anything to say about art as a role? I mean, I, I like art. I'm, I'm all for, <laughs> I'm all for art. I, you know, art, art has, has has you know played an important uh, role as a as a, an expression of um, uh, not just the the issues. I mean, we can all point to uh, different forms of artistic expression that point uh, to the issues. But I think you know also as uh, as expressions of of hope and desire for a different kind of society. I think sometimes you know. Artifice has a, as a way of coming at some of these issues in a different way that is not just about, you know, the documenting the, the real nature of them, but also being able to expose people 
uh, to a, a variation of these problems in, a, um, in, in many different kinds of forms and um, expressions. So yeah, I think, I think art is, um, is a, an incredibly important part of our movement. Other questions? Raise your hands really high. Yeah, right there. Thanks for the talk. Thank you. I can't help think, thinking of a Venn diagram and like identity, politics, and then for me, like culture is a third one. And so I'm just curious, you know, living in a non-homogenous society and culture in the United States, um, what you see as the obstacles to creating a culture of solidarity, both from a racial and a class standpoint. I think, you know, in, in, in this country, the, the main vehicle for that, I think, has been this kind of false scarcity um, that has us often pitted against each other uh, for, you know, the, whether it's, it's, it's school, it's, it's money, it's, you know, funding, um, whatever it is, we're constantly told that there's not enough and uh, that people are, are, you know, pitted against each other to fight for um, the, the scraps. And then over, you know, overlaid onto that uh, is the way that that scarcity is then racialized. And so we're told that, um, you know, immigrants come, you know, make the hard trek to this country just to steal things from uh, Americans, whether it's space, whether it's jobs, uh, whether it's, you know, welfare in a country with no welfare state. Um, you know, we're told that uh, black people um, use up the resources by, through criminal activity. And so they're the reason why we need an $80 billion a year uh, criminal justice system. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Muslims want to terrorize all of us. So the, these are the, the kind of lies and mythologies that are overlaid onto uh, a, uh, a perpetual fake uh, crisis that is generated um, by those who hoard the resources um, in this country. And so there are times when that, you know, Though both of those dynamics are uh, laid bare. I think it, you know, that is the other important aspect of how social movements can actually prolong our attention or protest. It doesn't even need to be a social movement. Protests and demonstrations can prolong our attention and focus on issues that are otherwise covered up. And through a prolonged engagement, um, new information uh, comes to light. The, the actual uh, uh, dynamics and roots to um, the, the, the problem um, may be, become more visible as a result of prolonged attention to that. And so I think, you know, you look at something like um, Black Lives Matter and the way that the prolonged attention um, on uh, policing and uh, police brutality, uh, you know, for some, raise the question as to, or challenge the perception that this was, these are all just matters of bad apples. These are all just, you know, uh, cops who've gone uh, astray. Um, explanations that were sufficient in periods without the long attention created by, um, uh, the, the Black Lives Matter movement. And so there, there's no, I mean, this is the, the, the kind of permanent dynamic of capitalism. Um, it, and, and so that makes it difficult to say, therefore, if we just do this. Um, but it is the case, I think, that um, the, the, the crises in this country have been become so acute that um, it has opened the, the space for this Sanders campaign, which if, if you know anything about American history and the virulence of the American state against socialists and, and communists, the fact that someone who defines themselves as a, as a socialist is running as a, is not just running, is surging ahead as a leading contender um, for the Democratic Party nomination is not just mind-boggling, but it 
just shows how rotten this society has, has become, that that is even, is, is even possible. And what it has done, it has forced this long view um, over not just a, a piece of the problem, but of the, the society as a whole. And so for months, um, you know, the mainstream media has treated, and the, the, the leadership of the Democratic Party has treated Sanders as a gimmick, as this like weird thing over here that we can just keep leaving off of polls and, you know, ignoring and pretending doesn't actually exist. And they're not able to do that. And so that means now you have to ask the question of why this socialist you know, in the, you know, red meat eating capitalist United States is a leading contender. And so that opens the long view on many aspects of our um, society. And so those are all the kind of objective conditions that can lead to um, a transformation of uh, these cultural, political, cultural uh, questions. But the subjective the, the subjective issue is one of organization. Um, and, and that, when TJ wrote the, read the quote from my book um, at, the, at the very, in his introduction, the, the subjective question is, is, is there a group of people there? And not, you know, not a small sect, but like a, a movement that has an analysis of why this scarcity is false and why they use racism uh, uh, to divide our movement. Is that connected to an analysis and an organization and ultimately a, a, a movement that can transform the underlying conditions that give rise to those uh, tools from their side in the first place? Um, the tools of false scarcity and divide and conquer. Okay, let's see. Yes, in the sweater right there. Stand up, there's, uh, where is the, there we go, here comes the microphone. Welcome. Thank you. Um, hello, thank you for coming, really appreciate the talk. Um, my question is regarding like labor within these movements and free labor. <sighs> I do not want to get into it because it's late. And but I really want to ask, like, what are words? Um, like free labor within like black liberation movements that eventually get turned around as like, hey, this is a symbolic note of change when really we were trying to kill you the whole time. Is that a good enough question? I, no. Okay. <laughs> Um, so basically, the work of labor within movements, so if we think of the wildcat strike right now and all the labor that the grad students are doing unpaid mm -hmm. for free and things to eventually get changed, that the university is basically going to say 10 years later, look at what we did, look at what we accommodated 10 years ago while these people are starving and killing themselves for this movement and the struggle for liberation. That happens a lot throughout social justice movements, and I want to know your take, your comment on that type of labor. Um... I think that social transformation often is about sacrifice. Um, I think that there is an insidious um, aspect of NGO culture that has entered into our movement spaces that uh, have attempted to professionalize um, activism in ways that is utterly distorting. Um, and so I don't think, you know, I think the sacrifice has to be shared. Um, but in, you know, I've been an activist for, um, for a very long time, and it's only really in the last maybe 10 um, years or so where, I mean, we, you know, we didn't write grants. When, when we were organizing, uh, you know, against the war in 2001 or the global justice movement, we didn't write grants for things. We passed the hat and people, you know, made copies at work and you like lied and hid what you were doing. And, you know, I worked for a long time in the anti-death penalty 
movement, my, you know, my credit was destroyed for years because when prisoners call you, it, it's, you know, it's like it, very expensive, you know, at a time where when I moved to Chicago, I didn't have health insurance. I, you know, had a, a weird job that sometimes paid me, most times didn't. And, you know, I, my phone got turned off all the time and I was broke and, and that was, you know, that was the, the, that was the life that I was living. Um, and so it's, to me, it's a recent phenomenon where NGOs have entered into the fray. They, they hire people and, and there's this, this professionalization of activism that is distorting because not only in terms of people's expectations around um, social movements and the activism that they do, but then you have these full-time employees who um, uh, have more say, have more uh, authority and influence because they're uh, employees in the direction of um, uh, of organizing and, and, and social movements. And it doesn't mean that, that that is all evil or, or bad or anything like that, but that it has, has I think, in some ways distorted a, a long history. And, and NGOs have, have you know, there, there were foundation dollars um, in the civil rights movement and much earlier. Megan Ming Francis, um, who's a professor at uh, University of Washington, Seattle, uh, has wrote, really written this brilliant article about what she describes as movement capture. Um, and she uses the NAACP in the 1930s to make this point, which was that, you know, how did the NAACP go from uh, its origins and focus on anti-lynching to education? The, the foundation funders told them to do so. Um, and so the article's more complicated than that, but it shows this sort of long arc in history uh, of the distorted impact that, that foundations and NGOs can have um, in our social movements. And so I, I think that the main thing I, I would say is that the, you know, the sacrifice and the burnout has to be shared and has to be democratically uh, distributed. Um, it can't just be, you know, the, the one or two um, people in a group. And that relates to the democratic culture in a group. It relates to uh, the way in which decisions are made and the level of uh, discussion and cohesion um, that exists. And, you know, when the dynamic is, is super far off, then that really points to deeper and other kinds of uh, political uh, issues and in, in the movement organizing, I think. Questions. Yes. Hi. Good evening. Hi. Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. Speech. My name is Raúl González, and um, I guess my question is this: Can we um, radicalize change through consciousness in reminding white folks, America, and the so-called state of liberty, the origins of this country's wealth and power that it, that it inherited through genocide, slavery, and the depletion of indigenous and brown folks rightful land that was once Alaska, Canada, the United States, Mexico, Central America, and South America in order to uphold justice in our legal system, to take responsibility of broken treaties and the, the dehumanization, scrutiny amongst people of color in America. Also, to remind folks that migration is a human right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, that's, we have to. We, we won't win if we don't. And so when I talk about solidarity and, 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 and including white people in that, um, one, it's, it's not out of some weird, you know, rainbow uh, thing. Um, Although the original Rainbow Coalition was amazing. Yes, uh, the, the original Rainbow Coalition original, was amazing. Uh, um, you know, but it's, it's, it's that we all, I believe that we all have a, a stake in a different uh, kind of society, even in, in this one where uh, oppression and exploitation is, 
is experienced in, in rapid, you know, in massively uneven uh, uh, and unfair um, ways. Um, but when I talk about solidarity, it's not on the basis of ignoring or forgetting or, um, you know, pretending that uh, racism and uh, these other kinds of inequalities don't exist. It is about um, uh, exposing, it, it, it's about exposing and, and arguing uh, with people to understand the role, um, whether it's their complicity or benefit from the arrangement in this society that we can't have real solidarity without actually telling the truth um, about not just the nature of our society now, but that this is a country that is built through the genocide of its native population, that a small group of people were enriched from the enslavement of you know, black people, and that they multiplied the, 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 the money made from slavery a million times over through the massive exploitation of immigrant labor. And so that's a, that's a dubious history. And people have to, to understand that. And that is the basis upon which um, we build solidarity. I think a lot of times liberals um, want solidarity uh, without remembering without, you know, solidarity with amnesia, uh, solidarity built on being quiet and not rocking the boat. Um, and that, that's not a real solidarity, and it's certainly not one um, that will last. And so the way that you uh, articulated that is, is what we have to win people to, you know, because I'm of the belief that if most people in this country understood the history of genocide, of, of slavery and racism, of imperialism and exploitation, that they would be against it. And the reason why I think that is because the state goes to such incredible degrees to hide this history, right? Like they go to the ends of the earth to deny this history, to deny their motivations for, you know, intervening in, in this or that, you know, place. You know, we, we go to war in Iraq to liberate, you know, women in Afghanistan. Like, what? You know, like, why, why do you need this series of lies, you know, unless you were afraid that the truth might unleash something that your little 1% of the population can't contain? So the truth is, I mean, the truth really will um, help set us free. Okay, we have time for one more question. Steve. We need a mic right down here. Yeah. Who will get there? <laughs> so thank you, that was, that was great. Um, oh. I had a question, I think, for all movement people, both activists and scholars of movements, is this notion of both movement capture, but also um, the Sanders campaign. Can you institutionalize radicalism? No. How do you get that permanent sort of struggle, right? And, uh, you know, so we hold up movements, but we also want to change the power dynamic. Um, and so my question, which is just a very broad one, is how do you maintain that kind of momentum and take power? Can you have a left populism in power? I hope we find out. Um, I mean, to me, it's what is unique about the, the Sanders campaign. It's... There, you know, Elizabeth Warren has a plan, um, but Bernie, you know, is talking about the need for a movement. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not just, it can't just be a campaign slogan because we know Bernie Sanders could become president tomorrow and the entire Republican Party will be there with their own pitchforks. But then, you know, about three quarters of the Democratic Party uh, will be there too with their pitchforks, you know, and so, 
the only way any of this, I mean, the campaigns are hilarious in one sense. Everybody's talking about the, the thing that they're going to do when they become president, as if that, you know, do you, any of you people actually know how government works? <laughs> um, and, and so, and that, that's, you know, our, our government is set up to fail, right? They call it checks and balances. It's actually set up to not accomplish anything, and that was by um, design. And so the only way that our side has ever gotten anything um, is by that coercive force of uh, the social movement that um, forces them uh, to, to, you know, momentarily transform things. Um, and so it is the, the, the danger of a kind of broad left becoming completely enmeshed in the, the campaign, um, because there does have to be some degree of independence to, to be able to credibly and, and really challenge um, uh, the, the, the campaign now, you know, when, when bad positions are, are staked out, or if, if a Sanders um, a, a presidency were to, to take form. It can't be just like an appendage you know, of an administration, it has to be an independent, um, it has to be an independent uh, 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 entity. Um, and so that, you know, that's, that's part of the, um, the challenge right now, because it's always the case with uh, electoral politics in this country, it's just like completely consuming and, and takes the space of, uh, of, of everything else. And, um, it's 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 going to be it's going to be a challenge, but I don't think that um, radicalism and you you know over the last uh, couple of weeks you know Bernie's been saying it's not radical to have universal health care. It's you know he's trying not to to scare the hell out of uh, everyone, even though they're all um, counting their money and you know uh, are very afraid. They should be afraid. The billionaires should be afraid. Um, <laughs> But uh, no, I don't think that you can institutionalize uh, that in you know, the, 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 the presidency. Um, but I do think that um, the, the political uh, agenda that he's talking about, you know, is, uh, it is radical in this country. And um, at the same time, I think that without the kind of uh, independence and, and organizing, um, it'll make it hard to, to realize. And I know that it's a debate, you know, in, um, in, in broad sections of the left, like how, how do we relate to this and, you know, what's our relationship uh, to this? And, you know, I, th I think that it's a question that will become much sharper over uh, the course of the primaries. An another question that may uh, develop is when the Democratic leadership pulls its inevitable dirty trick, is do we leave? Is this, you know, is this our opportunity to finally get out of this, you know, fucking party of slavery and um, the Dixiecrats and, and, you know, form our own? Um, but that's another question. Um, but yeah. All right, with that, one more round of applause. Thank you very much. For